As you watch this teaching, I want to ask you to please like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends so more people can see it. This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. My name is Rick Renner. Welcome to today's program. Thank you for letting me come right into your space. And my friend, today we're going to begin a brand new series in the book of James. And this week I'm teaching a new series called How to Determine What God Gives and What God Never Gives. Wow, this is important for you to know. And in this series, we're going to be covering biblical guidelines to help you know what to receive and what to resist. It's very important for you to know what comes from God and what does not come from God. If you know what comes from God, then you know what to receive. If you know what does not come from God, then you know what to resist. And that's why I'm teaching this brand new life transforming series. It will revolutionize your thinking called how to determine what God gives and never gives. You need to hear it and hear it and hear it and hear it and really get this teaching down deep inside you. And you need to use the study guide while you hear it or while you see it so you can really reinforce this teaching down deep inside your heart. It really will revolutionize the way that you think. And we're also offering you right now my book called A Life Ablaze, 10 Simple Keys to living on fire for God. I can't think of anything better for you to be reading right now. You need to know what fuels you need to be injecting into your spiritual furnace so you can be ablaze for Jesus now and to the ends of your life. And in this book, I cover the 10 fuels you have to be putting into your fire for your fire to keep burning. This is a book you need to read, especially right now. So order yours today and you can order all of these things by going online or by giving us a call. And right now would be such a great time for you to become a partner with our ministry. Would you please become a partner? You might say, well, what's a partner? A partner is someone who financially regularly gives into our ministry, enabling us to take the teaching of the Bible to people all over the world. Partners are so powerful. You see, I can sit in this chair and I can teach, but I can't pay for this signal to go around the world. But when you're a partner, you literally put fuel in the tank so that we can take this teaching to people all over the planet. Right from where you are, you can change someone else's life and you don't even have to get out of your seat or move. Just go online or give us a call and boom, you can change another person's life. I think that is amazing. And the moment you become a partner, we're going to send you Denise's book, which is called The Gift of Forgiveness. And we're going to send you my book, which is dedicated to partners, which is called Life in the Combat Zone. We always send these two books to anyone who becomes a partner with our ministry. And please remember that if you need prayer, we're waiting to hear from you right now. Ring the phone or send us your email, and the moment we hear from you, we're going to release our faith because we believe Jeremiah 33.3. It says, call unto me and I will answer you. Wait, he won't just answer us. It says, and I will show you great and mighty things. If you let us know how to pray, we'll call out to God in faith with you. God will answer us and God will move mightily in your life. But let us know how to pray. So ring us or send us your email right now, but I'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. My friend, I am so glad you've joined me for this exciting study in the book of James. And this week, we're going to be looking at James verses 1 to 20, and we're going to see what God gives and what God never gives. But we're going to begin in James chapter 1, verse 1, and really unpack this verse. But let me begin by telling you that the epistle of James is the oldest book in the New Testament. But reach for your Bible, and let's go to James chapter 1, verse 1, where the Bible says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Let's begin with James. Who is this James? This James 
was the leader of the church in the city of Jerusalem, but even more important than that, he was the half-brother of Jesus. You say, what? Jesus had a half-brother? How could he have a half-brother? Well, he didn't just have one. He had four brothers. He had at least two sisters. I'm going to show that to you in the scripture in just a moment. But James was the half-brother of Jesus. And the reason I call him the half-brother of Jesus is because James and Jesus had the same mother, but they did not have the same father. James' father was Joseph, but Jesus' father was God. He was the son of God. But as you study the scripture, you find that according to Matthew chapter 1, verse 25, Mary and Joseph had no sexual union until after the birth of Jesus. And after the birth of Jesus, they were sexually united as a normal married couple, and they produced additional children. And we read about this in Matthew 13, verse 55 and verse 56. This may be a surprise to you, but listen to what the Bible says. Is not this the carpenter's son? It's referring to Jesus. Is not his mother called Mary? Now listen to this. And his brothers, brothers, he had brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. And verse 56 says, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Jesus was the firstborn son and he was God in the flesh. Next was James, who wrote the book of James. He was followed by Joseph, who obviously was named after his father. Then Simon was the third son. Then there was a fourth son whose name was Jude. And it's the same Jude who wrote the book of Jude in the New Testament. Wow. And in Greek, the word sisters is plural, which means there were at least two. It doesn't mean there were only two, but at least there were two. So when you look at this family, it is a remarkable family Indeed, it began with Mary, who was a virgin and supernaturally conceived Jesus in her womb. He was the son of God. Then she and Joseph produced James, then Joseph, then Simon, then Jude, at least two girls. And we know from what early church fathers wrote that eventually the entire family began to work in the ministry. This was a God-called family. I think that is amazing. But... The Bible also tells us that it didn't begin so well with Jesus and his brothers. They didn't believe in him at all. In fact, they really felt antagonistic feelings toward Jesus. The Bible tells us in John 7, verse 5, for neither did his brethren believe in him. That is amazing to me that they could grow up in the same household with Jesus and not believe in him. But that's what the Bible tells us. And we know from the writings of early church fathers that James was even antagonistic toward Jesus. Now you may ask, how could you grow up in the same household with Jesus and be antagonistic toward Jesus? Well, just imagine if you were James and your older brother was Jesus, who was God in the flesh. He was the picture of perfection. And all the time you were hearing from your parents, why can't you be like Jesus? Why can't you be like Jesus? And James felt he never did anything right and was constantly being compared to Jesus. And by the time Jesus' ministry began and James became an adult, he felt great resentment toward Jesus. This is very well documented by early church fathers. Jesus was aware of the tension and the turmoil in James toward him. So when Jesus was raised from the dead, one of the first things he did was appear to his brother, James. And we read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. Listen to this. The Apostle Paul writes, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Verse 4 and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Verse 5, and he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve, verse 6, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Then in verse 7, Paul writes, and after that he was seen of James. He was seen of James. And when G James saw Jesus was raised from the dead, that's when he finally understood why his brother was so good. It wasn't that he was simply so good. He was God in the flesh. 
And when Jesus appeared to James, that was the moment of James' conversion. And that's when he no longer called him Jesus, but he began to call him the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. At that moment, James was radically converted. And we know from Acts chapter 15 that James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And we know that when the Apostle Paul came to Jerusalem and spoke with the church leaders that were there, he met with James and all of the others. That is recorded in Galatians chapter 1, verse 19. But James became a great convert. He became the servant of his elder brother, whom he now calls the Lord Jesus Christ, and literally became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. But when you look at Scripture, you find that God specializes in calling families. God wants to call your family. Mary and Joseph raised a family that all worked in the ministry. Jesus, their firstborn, was God in the flesh, and he was the Messiah. James became the head of the church in Jerusalem. Jude was very active in the ministry and wrote the book of Jude. And early Christian writers tell us that even Jesus' sisters were involved in the work of the ministry. God is in the business of calling families. And you see this both in the Old and in the New Testament. For example, in the book of Genesis, we find that God didn't just call Noah. He called Noah and his wife and Noah's three sons and their wives. We find that God called Abraham and Sarah and their whole lineage, which included Isaac and Rebekah. We find that God called Jacob and his 12 sons. Or how about God calling Moses and his brother Aaron and their sister Miriam? God specializes in calling entire families. Then you come to the New Testament and as we've already seen, God called Mary and Joseph and their entire family or How about Zachariah and Elizabeth? They had a son whose name was John the Baptist. God called that entire family. Or how about James and John, the sons of Zebedee? These two brothers were both called into the ministry. Or how about the two brothers, Peter and Andrew? Here we find God's call again extended to an entire family. Or how about the apostle Paul himself? Listen to what he writes in Romans chapter 16, verse 7. He says, salute Andronicus and Junia. Now listen to this. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen. It means my relatives and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Which means Paul was not the first in his family to get saved. He had two relatives named Andronicus and Junia his kinsmen who were of note among the apostles, which means there were three apostles in the same family. That is amazing to me. God called another family into the ministry. When you come to the book of Acts, you find there was a man whose name was Barnabas. His name means the son of encouragement. Barnabas became a prophet. He became a teacher. He became an apostle. And he had a sister whose name was Mary. His sister Mary had a big room in the city of Jerusalem near the temple, which is where Pentecost took place. I did an entire series called Upper Room Realities about all the events that took place in that room that belonged to Mary. And she had a son whose name was John Mark. Barnabas, Mary, and John Mark. And John Mark became the scribe for the Apostle Peter, and wrote the Gospel of Peter, which really is Peter's Gospel, but it's named Mark because John Mark penned it. Another family called entirely by God into the ministry. I think that is just amazing. But if you look at all of these examples, it all starts with one individual. When God saves entire families, His call is initiated with one person who has an encounter with God. Maybe you're the only person in your family right now that knows God, but it begins with one. Noah was the one in his family who heard from God. No one else heard, but Noah heard, and it resulted in his entire family being called. Or how about Abraham? Sarah was not there when Abraham met God. He met God by himself. It was initiated with Abraham, but it came to his wife, it came to his lineage, and we know the rest of the story, but it all began with one individual. And there's a powerful promise God makes to you and to me in Acts 
chapter 16, verse 31, which says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. It doesn't mean everyone in the house is automatically saved just because you are, but God is going to call your whole house. Everyone in your family will come to Christ through you, but it begins with one. Make no mistake, God wants to use your entire family to advance the cause of the kingdom of God. But let's talk about the end of James' life. James served in the city of Jerusalem. He was called James the Just. And early Christian writers said that his knees looked like the knees of a camel. You know why? Because he spent so many hours on his knees praying to the one that he grew up with, who he came to understand was not just his good elder brother, but it was actually God in the flesh. And when you come to James chapter 1, verse 1, when he calls Jesus the Lord Jesus Christ, listen to me, because James is the oldest book of the New Testament, that is the first time those words are used to describe Jesus in a written form. The Lord Jesus Christ were words which were first used on paper by James, and he was referring to his elder brother. But let's go on. What do we know about the end of his life? Well, we know that he was so influential in the city of Jerusalem that the Jewish leaders came to him and said, James, we want to make a deal with you. We want you to announce, renounce your brother and declare that he was a fraud. And if you do, we'll give you power. We'll give you prestige. And James said, let's do it. And guess what they did? They led him to the pinnacle of the temple, which is the same place where the devil led Jesus when he offered Jesus power and glory. It tells me the devil is not very creative. He just keeps doing the same thing over and over and over. And that's why when you learn the pattern of how the devil works, then you can defeat him because you can recognize his pattern and you can stop him. But they led him to the pinnacle of the temple and summoned the people of Jerusalem who were standing around the base announced that James had a proclamation to make. And when all the people were gathered together, James seized the moment and declared, this Jesus whom you've slain with wicked hands is raised from the dead, is exalted to the right hand of the Father, and he is both Lord and Christ. He declared the Lordship of Christ. And the religious leaders were so infuriated, they pushed him from the ledge of that pinnacle, he fell to the bottom where they beat him with clubs and he died in faith because of the testimony he held about his brother who was the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that is amazing. But hey, let's go back to James 1 verse 1 where it continues to say, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word servant here is so very important. It is the Greek word dolos, which is the most abject term for a slave in the New Testament. It describes one who was perpetually bound to do the bidding of his owner. His owner is his elder brother, who he calls the Lord Jesus Christ. A slave whose principal task is to fulfill the desires of his master for the rest of his life, to help, to assist and fulfill his master's wants and dreams to the exclusion of all else, it depicts a servant whose existence was to service his master in whatever way the master asked or demanded, and it pictures one whose will is completely swallowed up in the will of another. He has gone all the way from antagonism to full surrender. And notice that in this verse, he calls his elder brother the Lord Jesus Christ. We make this statement so often and don't even realize what we are saying. It was not an accident that James used this formula of words to describe his brother. For example, the word Lord is the word kurios. The word kurios means Lord or Supreme Master. But most importantly, it was used in the Old Testament Septuagint, which was the version of the Old Testament that James used to describe the Lord Jehovah. It is translated Jehovah in the Old Testament. So when he called his elder brother Jehovah, he was declaring that Jesus literally was Jehovah or God in the flesh. The name Jesus refers to his humanity. But the word Christ, the Greek word Christos, is the Greek word which describes the anointed one or the Messiah. 
So when James writes, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is making such a powerful declaration that Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh. He is not just a good man. He is not just a good teacher. He wasn't just a prophet. He was Lord Kurios. He was Jehovah in Jesus. He was the Christ. He was the anointed one, which means every single time you say the words, Lord Jesus Christ, you're making a statement you didn't even realize you are making. The word Lord, He is Jehovah. The word Jesus, this describes His humanity. He is Christos, He's Christ. He is the anointed one, He is the Messiah. So every time we say Lord Jesus Christ, we're literally declaring He is Jehovah in Jesus, in the flesh. He is the anointed one of the New Testament, the Messiah that we have been waiting for. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. But wait. Then verse 1 goes on to say, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greeting. What in the world do those words scattered abroad mean? Well, they're very powerful words that you need to understand because it describes the plight of of these believers, what has happened to them. But that's what we're going to cover when we come back tomorrow, that these believers were struggling to know if what they were experiencing was from God or from some other source. And it's very important that you know how to discern what comes from God and what never comes from God. And that is what we're going to be covering this week. But I'll be back in just a moment, and I want to pray for you. Someone asked the question, can children receive communion? Why not? If they're saved, of course they can receive communion. Communion is for anyone that is born again. And Jesus calls on us to pull up a chair and sit at the table and partake of communion, which really is a symbol of his covenant with us. I was saved when I was five years old. And from a very early age, I began to receive communion. And if you have a child or a grandchild or know someone who's young, but they're really saved, of course they can celebrate communion. And in fact, maybe you should celebrate their first communion with you. Make it a big event. Tell them what communion is about. And by the way, if you don't know, reach out to us because in our ministry, we have an entire series that we have done on what is communion. But yes, if a child is really born again, he indeed can receive communion. Is it difficult for you to figure out what God gives and doesn't give? For example, do you wonder if God ever permits tragedy? Has someone ever told you that God has allowed bad things to happen to you? And if bad things have happened to you, how can you resist them, overcome them, and get back on track again? All of these questions are answered in this five-part series, How to Determine What God Gives and Never Gives. In this series, Rick Renner also teaches you how supernatural joy will empower you to make it through difficult circumstances, how endurance will help you hang in there until you receive what you need from God, how to know if you're in doubt or if you are asking in faith. Available in digital or physical formats starting at just $11. This series will revolutionize your thinking about what God gives and never gives. In addition to this teaching series, you can also purchase the book, A Life of Blaze. In this powerful book, Rick lays out everything you need to live an intimate, uncompromising life and stay on fire with the Holy Spirit's power for years to come. Don't delay in ordering your copy today because it will help you throw the right fuels into your fire to get you burning again. Order your copy of A Life of Blaze today for only $22. Don't miss this special offer, this series, How to Determine What God Gives and Never Gives, and the book, A Life of Blaze. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner and I'm standing on the balcony of our hotel in the eastern part of Turkey and that really is Mount Ararat. And today I'm doing programs about Noah's Ark. It's a full series called Discovering Noah's Ark, and we're gonna be bringing it to you very soon. But I wanna say thank you for being the most amazing partner. It's because of what you do that we are able to do what we do. There's a lot of us here, 
It takes a lot of money to produce these programs and we're doing it for the body of Christ. We want it to be a blessing and we want the Bible to be something that comes alive. You know, we believe in teaching that people can trust and that's what we are here to produce. And we're able to do it because of the anointing, the grace of God and your giving. You are such a big part of this. So today, I just wanted to say thank you. What did you learn from today's program about James? Would you please write to me and say, Brother Rick, I did not know this, or I didn't know this. Let me know how this program has been a blessing to you today. But I want you to understand, God is in the business of calling families. Maybe you're the only current believer or the only one serving God in your house right now. It has to begin with someone, but God wants to call your whole house, everyone in your family, and you need to stand in faith for it. And if you need someone to pray with you about your family, call us or send us an email. We would love to pray with you. But remember that I'm offering you right now my series, which is called How to Determine What God Gives and Never Gives. The subtitle says Biblical Guidelines to Help You Know What to Receive and what to resist. You need to know this is very, very important. Knowing the answer to these questions could determine what happens to you. And this series comes with a study guide that is loaded. It is so huge. And when you have the study guide, you can read while you see or while you hear. So you can really get this teaching down deep inside you. And this really is teaching that you need to hear and hear and hear and hear again. Get it in you. And we're also offering you right now my book, which is called A Life of Blaze, 10 Simple Keys to Living on Fire for God. So many people start in fire and then they lose it. God wants you to stay on fire to the end of your life. And this book is about the 10 simple keys you need to live on fire for God, a life ablaze. You can order all of these by going online or by giving us a call. And please, again, let us know how to pray for you. And I want to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you that your call to families begins with one. We thank you that you've called us and we pray that through us, your call will be extended into all of our family, into all of our relatives, that our whole houses will be saved. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. I'll see you tomorrow, but please remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, now is the time for you to experience a new life Jesus has to give you. Pray this prayer with me right now. Lord, I repent of my sin and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Wash away my sin and make me completely new. I thank you that my sin is removed and Satan no longer has any right to lay claim on me. I faithfully promise that I will serve you as my Lord for the rest of my life. Amen. This program was made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Please like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends so more people can see it.